And CWS is about having conversations with people about their journey, how they're using their gifts and talents to help others, and to make a positive contribution to humanity. As such, I'm always looking for people who are doing extraordinary things or doing things extraordinarily well. One of the things I always ad advise is the importance of giving beyond ourselves, the importance of giving without expectations. We are here tonight to share with you this gentleman, this doctor, this innovator, Dr. Ornest Madhu. I'm not going to take a break. I'm just going to bring him on split screen. Dr. Madhu. Uh, hello, Selwyn. Thanks for having me. Good evening. Good evening to you. <laughs> <laughs> my brother, my brother, you know, <laughs> the first time I saw you was on TED. Yes. I was just browsing, looking for things, and things in Africa. And right. um, I had just heard a speech by uh, this guy, Nadu, talking about Africa as an, in, as an important place for development and investment. And then I, I came on your speech. And there's only one thing I must say to you. Yeah. I was left hanging when you ended, only because I wanted to hear more. I mean, <laughs> affordable health care for poor communities, brother? And yes. you have championed this cause for so long? No, we have to share this with as many people as possible. So congratulations on all your accomplishments. Oh, thank you, and uh, thanks for having me. Oh, you are quite welcome. I am, you know, since we have lost time, I'm just going to read a few, a few snippets of who you are, and then we'll get straight into it. Okay. Founder and CEO, founder Center of of Excellence for Cardiovascular Disease Treatment in the English Speaking Caribbean. Dr. Madhu is an internationally recognized cardiologist and an accomplished clinical investigator whose research works have been presented internationally published and cited in leading journals of cardiovascular medicine, including the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, Circulation and Nature. He is a fellow of the American College of Cardiology, American College of Physicians, and the American College of Chest Physicians. Dr. Madhu is one of a handful of non-European cardiologists to be recognized with the award of Fellow of the European Society of Cardiology College. He serves as a reviewer for several leading cardiology journals, including the journals Echocardiography, Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography, Circulation, Chest, and the American Journal of, of Cardiology. He has served as member of the International Committee of the American Heart Association and on the board of the Association of Black Cardiologists. He has also previously served on the clinical faculty of the University of Florida and UCLA, both in the U.S., a successful healthcare entrepreneur, Dr. Madhu serves on the boards of International Healthcare Services Limited, Medical Imaging and Diagnostic Inc., and Echo Doctors of America, LLC. Dr. Madhu, lecturing, teaching, saving lives through innovation, and reducing costs in your endeavor to provide affordable healthcare to poor communities are truly beyond words. Did you ever imagine? that your career, your life would have turned out this way, that you would be so dedicated to such a cause? Um, you know, very interesting. Uh, the honest answer will be no. Yeah, you never know how your life will turn out, but you do know what you believe in. Uh, you believe in making a difference. You believe in solving problems. You believe in equity. You believe in fairness. You believe in redressing wrongs where you see them. Now, you will never be sure how exactly you are going to redress those wrongs. But as long as you believe and you have the courage to pursue your dreams mm -hmm. and you are passionate about what you do, ultimately, you will find an anchor, you'll find a channel towards where you can express all of these virtues. Uh, just reminds me of a quote I heard recently from Maya Angelou. Uh, talks about courage being the most significant of virtues because without courage, it's impossible to practice the other virtues. So the most important thing for me is having the courage, you know, to drive my passion, you know, to make a difference in the world. And uh, hopefully, with the support of many others along the way, uh, we believe that we're making some little contribution and to the global community. Wonderful. 
I, I'm interested in exploring the genesis of such an amazing human being. So can you tell us where exactly you were born and what do you remember about growing up as a, as a nine-year-old and then as a 15-year-old? Um, I, I was born in Nigeria. I was born on the eastern part of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when in my days as a nine-year-old, um, they have very good uh, memories to remember. If For those who follow the history of uh, Nigeria and uh, West Africa, you might be familiar with uh, uh, the worst, uh, probably the most uh, uh, horrific crimes against humanity committed against the eastern part of Nigeria, uh, resulting in a 30-month civil war. Uh, Biafra was an enclave that succeeded out of Nigeria at the time because of the genocide committed against the Easterners. I was young at the time. That's the memory of my nine-year-old person. Uh, we were running from place to place because of bombardments. Area bombardments lost a lot of my very close friends uh, who were killed because of the bombings. And uh, so those images pers persisted, and I think that's where the roots were sown, seeing a lot of suffering and carnage during that war, uh, seeing a lot of helplessness and hopelessness, and seeing that, you know, adults that could be the ones that saving lives were actually the ones that were costing lives. Dr. As Maru, hold on a sec. Can I just interrupt you for one second? Uh, could you move back a little bit from the camera? You're not seeing, like, the bottom of your mouth. Just, okay. Yeah, not so far, but yes, yeah, that's good. That's good. That's okay. Good. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes. So those were the memories, uh, you know, at age nine. Uh, I was seven years old when the war started. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the war lasted for three years. I was 10 when the war ended. So my memory between the ages of actually from six to 10 uh, were memories that were clouded by a lot of carnage and devastation and helplessness and hopelessness occasioned by the war that was brought upon us. Now, seeing those events unfold during the war, seeing the amount of damage and devastation and disease and death occurring at such a young age, you know, it was quite an impression that was made on my very young mind. And at that point, I was, it was very clear to me that whatever I did, I had to be part of the solution, not the problem. Wonderful. Can you give us a glimpse of your teenage years in school, uh, in school, and, and what it was like for you? What did you like to read, and what were your favorite subjects? Well, you know, interesting, you know, the thing, now going back to the 15-year-old, uh, it was a very joyful time. You know, we were out of the war. Uh, we go, I was going to a boarding school, had a very uh, fantastic experience uh, going to that boarding school, College of the Immaculate Conception in Nigeria. Uh, we had very great teachers and mentors, and uh, we had very uh, strong team of young people who, who were very competitive and committed. Uh, at the time, you know, I fortunately for me, I was uh, very well rounded in the subjects. I was as good in arts as I was in science and mathematics. I did uh, pure maths, I did mathematics, I did English and uh, literature. My best subject at the time, actually, interestingly, was literature. And uh, I loved to read books. I loved to read about, you know, great people, uh, achievements in other places. Uh, as a 15-year-old, I would write fantastic articles about women in politics uh, around the world. I followed the careers of uh, Indira Gandhi, uh, people like Bandra Nike of Ceylon, at, 15, I, I think I was very well informed about what was going on around the world at 15 because the nature of the environment where I grew up uh, was the one that encouraged uh, scholarship, uh, encouraged inquiry, you know, critical thinking, you know, seeking for knowledge. We were just hungry for knowledge and we enjoyed it. Were, were, your, were your parents strict? Well, you know, I. If you ask my son, he will say they, they, they probably were very strict, <laughs> but not to us. I had very loving parents. You know, my uh, parents were very much interested in us being successful. Mm -hmm. That was the extent of the strictness. We had a strong uh, 
you know, moral grounding about what is right and what is wrong. Uh, we were all encouraged to always look to how to help others who were not as privileged. I will have to say I came from a fairly privileged background because, you know, I had everything I needed. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot of things and we were always, you know, made aware that though we were fortunate to have those things, uh, many people were not as fortunate, and we saw that because we had relatives who did not have as much. Uh, we had uh, extended family people uh, who did not have as much, and, but we always were brought up to understand that uh, we have a shared humanity. We're all one, you know, wealth does not define you, uh, positions do not define you, academic achievements do not define you. You know, we're one shared humanity, you know, we're as good as the next person. Um, is there one or a few words of wisdom you remember from, from either parent or both of them that you still use to this day? Uh, yeah, you know, quite a lot of them. You know, I, my father will always, uh, you know, remind us, uh, you know, that his name means that, you know, all gifts come from God. You know, so you cannot assume that you're getting it out of the power of your own will. Uh, it is by the grace of God that whatever you have or whatever you accomplish, you know, so that's one of the constant refrains in the house that in everything, you know, show gratitude, you know, be thankful to God because it's not just you, it is a blessing. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were always taught to be respectful of everyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, there was always that kind of, you know, sharing. Whatever you have, be willing to share it with the other people. And so, they, you know, we had all these, it was a constant, constant um, moral foundation that was being instilled in us as children and even as, an, as adults. I, you know, my father lived a long life. I, he passed away last year. Uh, one of his favorite things is a, a fool at 40 is a fool forever. So never be a fool. <laughs> so, we always try not to be foolish and stupid. <laughs> in, in May 2013, last year, you gave the opening keynote lecture at the World Congress of Nephrology in Hong Kong to thousands yeah. of thousands of physicians and, and um, from from all over the world. What would you say are some successes that came out of that Congress? Well, yeah, I think you know uh, it was quite uh, an honor to be uh, invited to do the opening day keynote uh, lecture because one of the things we've always tried to say is that the. Uh, Global problems, and then let's talk about healthcare for a minute. Yes. Uh, solving the problem with healthcare is not just about science. You know, science is important, but if you cannot translate the findings from science to the reach of the wider population, then something is wrong, right? Yeah. So if we take cardiovascular diseases, for example, uh, we know that about 32 million people will have heart attack or stroke every year, and we have 17 million people will die globally because of cardiovascular diseases. But most people will think that all of these deaths and uh, devastation are occurring in the West. It is not. 85% of the global disease burden for cardiovascular diseases occur in the developing countries of the world. And yet 85% of the resources are in the developed countries of the world. So flip it. What you see is that 85% of the resources are devoted to taking care of 15%. And 15% of the resources are available for 85%. Now, if you take the science that we're talking about, mm -hmm. much of the developing world do not have any benefit from the scientific discoveries that are coming because the foundations are weak, the infrastructure is weak, health literacy is non-existent. You know, until we recognize that beyond science, there is more we have to do to bring the benefit of science to others, then we are going to be missing out on a whole lot of people. That was the subject of my discussion in Hong Kong. The, my lecture was talking about what we need to do beyond science to get this, and that is in terms of education, you know, knowledge dispersion, uh, in terms of infrastructure, and economic improvement. Mm -hmm. All of those things are important in bringing the benefits of science to the people. You know, the, 
now, now, now that you mentioned that, um, I want to talk a little bit about the Heart Institute, HIC, the Art Institute of the Caribbean, which you founded about 10 years ago in, in Kingston, Jamaica, is now the premier center of excellence for cardiovascular care in the English-speaking Caribbean. What were conditions like when you got there, and what conditions uh, in particular improved remarkably over time? Uh, thank you. A very excellent question. Um, one of the you know, uh, motivations for starting the Heart Institute of the Caribbean was, again, to demonstrate in a tangible way that these problems can be solved, but you have to be committed to solving the problems, and you have to think out of the box. You can't, you know, there, I think there's an old saying I've seen that, uh, you know, uh, the, the mindset that created a problem cannot be the mindset that will bring a solution. If you want to solve a problem, you have to come with a different mindset. So several years ago, we came on a visit to Jamaica. And uh, while visiting Jamaica, we had um, you know, somebody that needed cardiovascular attention. Uh, then usually we know as cardiologists that if you have a cardiovascular problem, time is critical. You know, time between life and death can be seconds. Uh, unfortunately, you know, this individual was trying to get an appointment to see a cardiologist. Uh, the cavalier attitude that we saw was totally unacceptable, uh, telling the individual they have to come back, make an appointment for three months to get a consultation. Uh, I said, okay, why don't you get an echocardiogram or stress test? It's another three month wait. Now in three months, if you're actually having a cardiovascular problem, that individual could be dead. So we saw that there was a big problem and that was very surprising to us given the proximity of Jamaica to the United States and the amount of um, influence the United States has on Jamaica and the amount, the number of Jamaicans that have been very successful in the United States. Now, the other thing we thought was very odd was much of the well-to-do had already come to the acceptance that the way to get their cardiovascular care is to get on the plane and fly to Miami. Mm -hmm. Now, two problems here. If you actually do have a, an urgent cardiovascular situation, you cannot get to Miami. Even if you have your own plane in your driveway, you will be dead before you get to Miami. That's number one. The second one, is that we saw something that was so odd. You, we saw repatriation of wealth from a poor country to a rich country in search of health care. And we thought that didn't make any sense because that had to be the other way around. And that's why we decided to start on this journey. Now, when we set up the Heart Institute of the Caribbean, some of the key things that happened is that immediately the landscape for health care changed in Jamaica. It encouraged people in other areas of medicine to see that you could do things differently. What the colonial masters had bequeathed on the colonies had been essentially an outpatient department that focused mainly on prescription medicine. But that was 100 years ago. We have learned a lot over time that it is not prescriptions that help to cure everything. We know that diagnostics is very essential. We have an advancement in technology that has led to you know, making better diagnosis, effective better treatment strategies, saving money, actually. So to continue to practice a polyclinic model where people line up and get prescription, it's not the ideal way to practice medicine. And when we established the Institute, we showed that you can create a cardiovascular center of excellence where you can begin from the comprehensive diagnostic testing to therapeutic interventions. And it's been very well received by the people. And I think we've made some difference. 